Um, and they didn't know there was another side to the issue f for the obvious reason that the United States government is deeply uh, embedded within an economy of influence that drives government attention or policy attention towards places where campaign finance come. Um, so in the context <coughs> of copyright, there's only money on one side of this issue, and Democrats and Republicans both only listen, only hear, only know the issue from the perspective of the recording industry or the Motion Picture Association or the publishers. So we made progress in the public space, but could make no progress in the government space. Um, and that didn't seem like it was going to change because I or others figured more clever ways to kind of make our arguments. Argument wasn't really what was mattering here. Um, argument mattered to ordinary people, mattered to academics, it mattered to businesses because they could see what made sense and they cared about what made sense. But in the political space, what they cared about was what made dollars, campaign dollars, not cents. And, and, and what we were talking about didn't help them at all. Um, so about three years ago, I announced I was going to adopt a practice of every 10 years throwing away all of my intellectual capital and beginning again. Um, so I said I was going to give up all of my work on copyright and, and uh, the internet and begin to focus on this problem of corruption. But by corruption, I don't mean bribery. I don't mean anybody violating any law. I don't mean illegal corruption. I mean legal corruption. I mean the kind of corruption that exists within institutions when institutions create relationships that undermine the effectiveness or public trust of the institution. So um, doctors taking money from drug companies and then sitting on panels that review drugs. Nothing illegal about that, as long as it's disclosed. Um, nothing unethical about that, according to doctors. But what it does is lead people to wonder, when this doctor recommends this vaccine, is it because the vaccine is a good vaccine, or is it because the doctor is getting money from the drug company that supports the vaccine? Or academics taking money to give public testimony in cases around telecom or something. Are you saying Google is good because Google gave you half a million dollars in consulting fees, or are you saying Google is good because you've looked at the numbers and it turns out this is pro-competitive? Um, um, or in the context of think tanks, think tanks in Washington that are increasingly prominent in policymaking circles that are funded for particular purposes, or most obviously, most dramatically, the context of Congress, where members of Congress can spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back into Congress. Um, uh, they can't help but develop the sensitivity to fundraising that undermines their effectiveness as members of Congress. So the point was first to get people to recognize this is a kind of corruption. It's not bad soul corruption, evil people breaking the law. It's good people living within a system, but a system that can't help but systematically skew them away from the thing they're supposed to be thinking about. So if framers of our Constitution said they wanted to create a republic, by that they meant a representative democracy. Federalist 52 says a representative democracy means a democracy where uh, Congress is dependent upon the people alone. So there's an intended <coughs> dependency upon the people. It's supposed to guide what Congress is doing. We've substituted a dependency. There's now a dependency upon the funders as well as the people. And that, that competing dependency, like an alcoholic's dependency upon alcohol, you know, it's not like it totally blinds them to what they should be doing, but it distracts them from what they should be doing. And at the United <coughs> States level, it's distracted them so significantly that they cannot address even the most important public policy questions now without being deeply mired in the mud of this campaign funding. So, you know, I, when originally was thinking about that, was thinking about how it affected copyright, relatively esoteric public policy question. But it was, you know, obvious that it was also making it impossible for Congress to think about global warming, think about health care in an appropriate way, think about financial reform, think about every single important public policy issue because public policy issues were so blocked by this, uh, by this influence of campaign funding. Um, so I shifted my work to work on this problem of institutional corruption, as I call it, and in particular in the context of Congress. And this August, this October, um, we'll publish a book called uh, Republic Lost, which is a book about this problem in the context of Congress. Um, um, but just, uh, you know, the, to get a, just one very stark sense of how this, this problem plays itself out, um, there's a lot of debate in political science about whether we can actually show the link between campaign contributions and the votes Congress takes. And political scientists say, we can't really see a link. Um, and that leads some people to say, we don't actually know that money is affecting results. And so if we don't know, we shouldn't be doing anything about it. We shouldn't worry about the problem. 
my view is that's a misuse of the political science debate, but put that aside for a second. Here's one way in which you can get a really strong sense about the way in which money is, has corrupted our form of government. Um, if you ask the question, what was the issue Congress spent most of its time dealing with over the last six months? So, you know, we're in the middle of two wars. We've got a huge unemployment problem. We still have not passed effective financial reform. There's a huge battle about the deficit and about the budget, which has still not been passed. There's any number of other huge public policy issues around global warming we haven't even addressed. So there's a lot of important <coughs> stuff on the plate. What was the issue they spent most of their time on? By far the issue that got most attention in Congress in the last six months was the issue of bank swipe fees. So that's the question of when you use a debit card, <coughs> how much is your bank allowed to charge you for the swipe of the debit card? So the banks want to be able to charge you a lot, and the stores, the consumer retail outlets want that number to be low. There's $16 billion on the table. 274 lobbyists were on Capitol Hill trying to get Congress to go for the banks or to go for the retail. And Congress spent most of its time focused on that issue. Okay? Now, why? Well, because as Congress dances around this issue of bank swipe fees, the banks and the retail units dump hundreds of millions of dollars into lobbyists and into campaign contributions to try to sway them one way or the other. And so they do this dance for the purpose of raising campaign money and raising money for the lobbyist infrastructure which, they, which supports this. So that each year, you know, this was written up recently in the Huffington Post in this, the money line, I don't think the authors even recognize. They say there's no issue that's ever decided finally in Washington. This year's defeat is next year's battle. Each year this issue comes up. Each year they go through this dance in the same way. Each year they spend an enormous amount of time doing this. And they do it solely because, not this is the most important issue Congress should be facing, solely because it's a way to flush money into the system to fund campaigns. So if, if there's one absolutely clear place the money is distorting results, it's an agenda setting. An agenda setting now is driven by campaign issues, not about importance of the issue. Why would you worry about unemployment? Where's the money in unemployment? Like, you know, who's, it's not like the unemployed are going to give campaign contributions, so why waste any committee time or any floor time to the question of unemployment, right? Um, and this is the most uh, dramatic way in which the system uh, gets distorted. Now, I came here yesterday because in the area of copyright and intellectual property, we have, we have an extremely corrupted policymaking process. The USTR is just captured by the extreme copyright interests in the United States. It's just captured by them. There's no ambiguity about this is not controversial. They are just the expression of a, an extreme version of policy which this special interest is interested in. And there's no political resistance to this at all. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans care at all about the fact that they're captured. And they just express this kind of captured position. So in my view, and in the view of most scholars, the kind of policies which they're advancing do not make sense from the standpoint of increasing the wealth of society globally. They make no sense. They might make sense for a tiny slice of the American economy, but they, but they don't make sense even for the American economy as a whole. But in the American political system, there's no pushback. So because there's no pushback, this is the expression of the American government's position. The American government then uses its extraordinary power to blackmail countries around the world into signing up to this extreme and crazy IP regime. Um, and so they've done it with Australia. They do it with you. They do it with all sorts of sensible democracies around the world. And sensible democracies face this obvious dilemma. They can sign up and get the benefits of trade with the United States, but give up sensible policymaking in this one particular area. Or they could say, to hell with you. We're not going to sign your stupid IP stuff and then lose the benefits of trade. And of course, that's too expensive for most sensible democracies, so they all buy into this. And my point yesterday was to say, we should recognize that there are healthy democracies and there are less healthy democracies. There are democracies that, however much there's a fight between the labor government and the national governments about particular policies, that actually do achieve relatively consistently respect for something of a public will, Special interests are present, but they're relatively muted relative to other governments. Um, and of course, buttressed by the fact that in this country, you are known to be the least corrupt government in the whole world. You and Denmark are the two leading countries, according to Transparency International. 
um, you should recognize that this democracy is um, an inspiration in the field of modern democracies. Um, and, that, and that there should be some moral standing that distinguishes democracies. Uh, and that a democracy like yours should feel entitled and uh, should feel an obligation to stand up to the less healthy brother, you know, the alcoholic brother, you know, the alcoholic brother who comes along and recommends policies to you. And you know it's the alcoholism that's driving the recommendation, you know, um, and not sensible policy making. You should stand up and like the res relation you have to your alcoholic brother, with <laughs> love, you should encourage them to get clean and you shouldn't pay attention to the things they tell you to do. Um, and so my argument yesterday was, in this area in particular, we've got to get, find a way for the clean, sensible, balanced, uh, high-functioning democracies to begin to put resistance against this not-so-high-functioning democracy in the area of these policy issues. Because if we don't, the, the corruption that is the United States government slowly gets exported to other governments around the world. And every time you accept policy recommendations of this corrupt government, you have imported that corruption into your own system. And there is, in the long run, in a wide range of areas, great harm that comes from not developing resistance to that kind of infection. Um, and, uh, and so I was eager to flee, fling myself for 48 hours all the way to the other side of the world to make this plea both in the public context and in this most pri more private context. Um, but that's as much as I'm going to say because there's a lot of food and nobody's eating anything. And, um, <laughs> so should we take food and then we can answer questions? Or Great. So thank you very much.